Hello, my name is Francois Ave, and I will show you in this MOOC the different information we can get using scanning electron microscopy for the characterization of the microstructure of cementitious material. We first need to understand how a microscope works and what happens when electrons are sent to a sample and hit the surface of a material. So the first question we could ask is why do we use electrons rather than visible light? The first approach for observing the microstructure is the use of optical microscope using the light as the source of emissions. However, the resolution of light microscopy is limited by the wavelength of the visible light between 400 to 800 nanometers. The wavelength of electrons is actually much smaller, around 1 to 10 picometers. It permits to observe much smaller objects and to get a much better resolution. In the case of electron microscopy, the resolution is actually not limited by the wavelength of electrons, but by the aberrations inside the microscope, which are kinds of physical deviations caused by the microscope lenses. The most common type of microscopy to observe the microstructure of cementitious materials is scanning electron microscopy, which is actually more accessible and easier to use than transmission electron microscopy. In a scanning electron microscope, Electrons are emitted from the electron source, they pass through a series of lenses which focus them, and then the electrons reach the surface of a sample here, and they undergo a series of elastic and inelastic collisions with the atoms of the sample. Different signals can be collected from these collisions. When we talk about a scanning electron microscope, it means that actually the surface of the sample will be analyzed point by point and the final image is actually the assemblage of the information from all these points. An incident electron, as you can see here, faces a series of interactions before its energy is fully dissipated. Thus, all these interactions from this incident electron and the, the electrons of the sample does not occur exactly at the entering point of the electrons, but they occur in a more global volume, which is called the interaction volume. These interactions can be either elastic with no energy loss or inelastic. The first kind of interaction which can occur between the incident electron and the atoms of a sample is if an incident electron, as shown here, collides with an electron of uh, the atom of the sample. From this collision, the incident electron is deviated, like this, and the bound electron is ejected. This ejected electron is called a secondary electron, or also called SE. The energy of the secondary electrons is typically lower than 50 electrovolts, which is actually very small. Thus, if these electrons want to be collected by the detector, they have to be formed very close to the sample surface. If they are formed deeper in the sample, then these electrons would face some interactions before reaching the sample surface. They would be absorbed in the sample due to their low energy, and they would not be collected by the secondary electron detector. So thus, the contrast we can obtain with the secondary electrons is a topographic contrast, as you can see here. Here is shown three points where, second, with, where uh, incident electrons are sent, and you can see that actually this volume here is a volume where secondary electrons can escape and can be then detected. And you can see that at the edges, more electrons can escape the surface and thus can be collected. This means that on the image, on these specific points, we'll get more signal and we'll have a brighter contrast. This is called the edge effect. Another kind of interaction which can occur is when an incident electron fills the Coulomb interactions with the nucleus of an atom of a sample. This incident electron is deviated because of this Coulomb interaction. If this deviation leads to high angle diffusion, then the electron can leave the surface and uh, it can be collected by the backscattered electron detector. 
So this electron which is scattered back is called backscattered electrons or BSE. This interaction is almost elastic, there is almost no energy transfer, which means that the energy of backscattered electrons is very similar to the energy of the incident beam. So which information can we obtain with backscattered electrons? Well, the Coulomb force with the nucleus increases with the atomic number Z. Indeed, with the increase of the atomic number, the number of positive charges of the atom increases. Thus, the incident electron has a higher likelihood to be deviated. If more electrons are deviated, more will also be collected. Thus, the contrast will be brighter on the image for a higher Z of the atom. This graph here shows you that uh, the brightness increases with the atomic number. This is here the backscatter coefficient, which is related to the intensity of the signal as a function of the atomic number. And you can see that if you have a material with a higher average Z inside, you can see that actually you will see something brighter on your image because you will collect more backscattered electrons. The third kind of interaction, which is very useful for the characterization of a microstructure of cementitious materials, is the formation of characteristic X-rays. After the emission of a secondary electron, shown here, an electron is missing in the layer of, uh, of the atom. This atom is ionized. If this missing electron originates from an inner electron shell of the atom, this atom is energetically unstable. In order to reach a more favorable energetic level, an electron falls from an outer shell with a higher energy to fill the vacancy. This release of energy during this relaxation phenomenon leads to the formation of an X-ray. And what is important is that the energy of this X-ray is related to the energy difference of the two shell levels here. Thus, the energy of these X-rays is characteristic of the atom they come from. The element these X-rays come from can thus be identified and the atom content can be quantified for the selected spot of a microstructure. This image shows you how the chamber of a microscope looks like. So you have here the end of a column, so this is the incident beam coming here, leading through this hole to the, to the chamber, so the sample holder is right below here. So you send electrons to the sample, you will have all these interactions, which then will be collected by different detectors. You have here the secondary electron detector with this grid on top. The golden plate here is this BAC detector, and the EDX detector is right at the back, a bit hidden. But so we can collect all of this information in uh, one microscope. These three types of interactions are very useful to characterize the microstructure of cementitious materials. In the next session, you will see how to set an ice image and some applications of these three types of interactions for cementitious materials. The first application for um, secondary electrons is the study of the morphology of particles. You can see here you have two very nice images showing you the morphology, for instance, here of kaolinite particles, so an anhydrous material, and here for the growth of CSH, so which is a hydration product at very early age of hydration. These secondary electrons are used because of this topographic contrast, which permits to really see nicely the morphology of the particles. This analysis is only qualitative. We cannot get any quantitative analysis from this study. But still, it permits to really have a look at uh, the different morphologies we can find in cementitious materials. So after talking about secondary electrons, we can now focus on backscattered electrons. To do so, it's always better to prepare your sample as a polished cross-section, as you saw before in the uh, sample preparation course. So the sample is put in a sample holder, like this, we just clips it, and then we will install it inside the microscope. 
So the chamber of a microscope is always under vacuum to avoid any contamination. And first the vacuum was broken using nitrogen gas and then the sample is gently put on the sample stage. We use a small giraffe just to check the height of the sample to make sure that we're not too far from the good focus. And then we close the chamber and we apply a vacuum again. So now the sample is inside the microscope and we just waited for a good vacuum to be done to make sure that we won't have any contamination. Moreover, it's very important to have a good vacuum, otherwise the electrons which are sent to the sample could interact with air molecules inside the chamber. So it's very important to remove as much as possible the air molecules present inside the chamber. When the vacuum is good enough, we can start applying a voltage which will lead to an emission of a current, an emission of electrons sent to the sample. So you just click on HV here and progressively we will see an image appearing on the screen. We start collecting backscattered electrons and this is the contrast you can see there. We have some really nice grey contrast showing um, the backscattered electron collected and so the different phases we see in a cementitious material. As you can see the image is a bit blur because we're not exactly in focus. So first we need to set the focus to make sure that we have the best resolution possible. So to change the focus we simply adjust the Z position of the stage to make sure that the sample is at a good height, okay? at a good working distance. So we can see here the typical microstructure of a plain Portland cement sample for which the hydration was stopped at 28 days. So different areas can be clearly distinguished. We can first observe bright grey areas. These bright areas correspond to anhydrous clinker grains. Between these anhydrous grains, a matrix of hydration products fills the space, fills the porosity with time. So in these bright grains, we can clearly identify C3S with this angular shape of grains. But you can also see that for some grains, we have not only one gray contrast, but several at the same time which means that actually clinker grains are polyphased and not all monophased. So I put on this uh, screen some phases which are likely to be there. With BSC you cannot directly know what is what, but we can demonstrate it, we can prove it later doing an EDX on these phases. Concerning the hydration products, we can first easily identify Portlandite or calcium hydroxide or CH is this kind of uniform microstructure you can see here. Uniform gray level, uh, which is actually brighter than the other hydrates. Otherwise, the main phase filling the rest of the porosity is the CSH phase, as you can see a bit everywhere. You can see either outer CSH here, also inner CSH, which grew inside the initial boundary of clinker grains. Etringite can also be observed, this kind of needles here, and the rest, which is black, is the porosity, which is dark, is the porosity. Why is porosity dark? Simply because we are sending electrons to these points and we do not collect anything back. This is why the contrast is dark like this. Another question we could ask is, why is the contrast of anhydrous phases brighter? Because hydrated phases contain water, which significantly decrease the average Z coefficient of the phase. Moreover, they are also less dense, which makes them look darker on the image. So we can have a look at plain PC systems, but also the main interest of using SEM is to look at other type of blends. Here is an example of limestone calcium clay cement, or LC3, at one day of hydration. In this system, the clay used uh, is not a pure calcium clay, pure metacaulin, but it's a clay with only 50% of, uh, of calcium inside. 
So the microstructure shows some differences compared with the plain cement observed before. First, we can observe limestone particles here, 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 also there, uh, with their regular shape with a small rim of CSH growing at their surface. In LC3, in limestone calcium clay cement, we can also, of course, observe calcium clay particles. And what you can see with these calcium clay particles, like here, 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 also there, here also, is that the gray level is not uniform everywhere. Why so? It means that we have actually impurities in the calcium clay. As I said before, this clay here contains only 50% of kaolinite, which means that the rest is impurities. For instance, this particle here on the top of, the, of this image shows a much brighter area on the right side. And this indicates that there is likely to have uh, elements with a higher atomic number, with higher Z, in this area, which is likely to be actually an iron impurity in the calcium clay. So with, with bascated electron imaging, we can have a very nice information on the uh, repartition of the phases in the macrostructure. But for the identification of phases, we do not have any evidence, any chemical evidence of the phases. Let's try now to carry out an EDX analysis on this macrostructure to identify several phases that we assumed to be present before. On this video is shown the quantification of a light phase. We spot several points of a light in the macrostructure in this grain here, and we're going to start the EDX analysis to get the chemical composition of a phase. As you can see, the quantification is very fast, and now we can have a look at the results. For EDX, there are some tricks to be aware of. First, it is impossible to quantify hydrogen. As we saw before, to form an X-ray, we need to have an electron fall from an upper layer of the atom. For hydrogen, it's impossible because of, there is only one electron. So we cannot quantify hydrogen with EDX. Another thing is that the quantification of oxygen and other light elements is not extremely reliable because of the extremely low energy you need to ionize oxygen and these other light elements. So that's why it's not very accurate. Thus, it is better actually to use atomic ratios from the chemical analysis than the direct values collected uh, on the software. For instance, for C3S here, instead of looking at the absolute values obtained, we can have a look at the calcium to silicon ratio. We know that in a light, we should have a calcium to silicon ratio close to three, an atomic calcium to silicon ratio close to three, which is the case here. So this evidences the presence of C3S in this grain. We can do so for all the other phases, anhydrous or hydrates, to evidence their presence in the macrostructure. The main issue for EDX analysis is the interaction volume we talked about at the beginning of this talk. When a specific spot is pointed, actually the information we, col we collect does not come from this point only, but comes from the interaction volume related to this point, which is a few microns, right? So if we are pointing just at the border between two phases, it is very likely to have information from both phases. This is an issue, especially for the determination of a CSH composition. So CSH and CASH are roughly the same thing. It's just that when, when there is a significant incorporation of aluminum in the CSH, we call it a CASH. In the case of LC3, for instance, we call it CASH. So when we point the CSH here, it is extremely likely to have information on other phases at the same time. Thus, the idea to get an accurate composition of a CSH is to use 
2D scatter plots to deal with intermixing problem. How does it work? The best way of doing it is to plot the aluminum to calcium ratio here, the atomic composition aluminum to calcium ratio, as a function of a silicon to calcium ratio. Why do we do that? Because the intermixing which can occur with Portlandite or calcium hydroxide, with atrangite or with the AFM phases, can be directly observed. These phases I just mentioned are present on the left axis here because they do not contain any silicon. This way we can isolate the points which are really CSH from the points which are coming with a bit of information of these uh, pure phases here, Portlandite, Etrangite and AFM phase. If you do that, so this is shown for an OPC system at 20 days of hydration and an LC3 system at 20 days of hydration, we can collect approximately 200 points per system and we get these kind of clouds of data. So if we have a look closer to the PC system, for instance, we have a cloud of data around this composition here, and we have some point deviating and going, for instance, here towards Portlandite. If we take, for instance, this point here, which is roughly in the middle between CH and this cloud of CSH, it means that for this point, we have information approximately about half from CH, from Portlandite, and half from the CSH. Now, how to find the exact CSH composition? You have this cloud of data here. The more you are on the left side of this cloud, the more you are intermixed with other phases. Which means that the right, correct CSH composition is at the right edge of a cloud. So, you can use these tie lines from, com from these phases with a fixed stoichiometrical composition to help you to find the real composition. The intersection of these lines from Portlandite, Etrangite and AFM phases should give you the good CSH composition. And what you can see then, you can apply it to different systems, which is the case here. So we have OPC and this LC3 system. And what we can see is that we have really strong differences in terms of CSH composition between this system. We have a strong silicon and aluminum incorporation in the CSH. This is a kind of valuable information you can get from uh, EDX analysis. Another thing you can do with EDX, which is uh, more global, let's say, is to get a phase distribution, not only on some points, but on a whole map in your system, which is an example is shown here for um, uh, an OPC system. So you simply select the elements you want, aluminum, silicon, calcium, magnesium, iron, oxygen, potassium, sodium, sulfur, and you can actually acquire an EDX, but not on a couple of points, but on each point of your map. So of course this takes more time, but this also gives you some valuable indication on the phase distribution inside your macrostructure. So that's another very nice example of uh, how we can use microscopy for um, cementitious materials. There are many other applications which can be uh, studied with a scanning electron microscope. For instance, we saw the porosity of these kind of dark areas under microstructure. This porosity, which is of course a kind of coarse porosity, like coarser than approximately one micron, can be quantified using image analysis and we can get a rough estimation on the porosity of the system. The size distribution of particles can also be determined. It's qualitative, but still it can be, it can give us an idea about the distribution of, uh, of a particle size. Another thing we can do with SCM is to look at uh, the gray level, for instance, of the inner CSH that you can see here on this, uh, on this microstructure. For instance, with temperature, we can see that we know that the density of the CSH changes and depending on the gray level intensity, we can calibrate it and know how much it changes with temperature. Finally, mapping can also be very useful to characterize the damage. 
For instance, for alkali silica reaction, it is extremely useful to follow the reaction of ASR and to know where the damage is and what really happens. It permits really to better understand the mechanisms of these reactions. To sum up what we saw, scanning electron microscopy is one of the most powerful techniques for the study of cementitious materials. We can do really many different things with a scanning electron microscope, from topography imaging to backscatter electron imaging from chemical analysis. And there are really many applications for which scanning electron microscope really permits to better understand what's going on in a cementitious material. Thank you for watching.